Hi, I'm Barbara McRae, and this is Littleton Common. Today we're going to visit with Bill Vales. But before we travel on and go to see him, I want to make a couple of announcements, and really big announcements, I think. One of them is the Veterans Lunch. Veterans Lunch is going to be held at the uh, town office building, first floor, multi-purpose room, on November 7th, and it'll be at noon. So if you want to go to this Veterans Lunch, please call 540-2474 and uh, reserve a seat, or else um, we won't be able to handle as many people that come. So please, please, RSVP. Also, and our speaker that day will be Hal uh, Baker. So we're looking forward to that. The next thing is the uh, Thrift Shop Fashion Show. And you know that I love talking about the Thrift Shop. We have clothes you won't believe, and you're going to enjoy this fashion show. That is November 14th. That, again, is at 1 o'clock, and uh, it's going to be in the same room, the multi-purpose room in the town office building. So why don't you uh, come and enjoy this fashion show with us? You'll be surprised at what we have. It's really great. And it's all because of you and all of your donations that come to us. Um, also, I want to say don't forget, that evening is the uh, town meeting. So um, get dressed up in our fashions from the fashion show and go to the town meeting. You'll look fabulous. You've heard about rock and roll, rock of ages, rock around the clock, the rockettes, and rock solid. Well, this show is going to be all about rocks. Today, we're a stone's throw away from Littleton Common with Bill Vales, and uh, Bill is a member of the Neshoba Valley Mineralogical Society and also an avid rock collector. And Bill is going to show us things around Littleton that may surprise you. So hi, Bill. Hi, Barbara. How are you? Good. How did you, you know, when did you start uh, this hobby of yours? Barbara, I've always been interested in the environment and things outside. Uh, when I was finishing up my degree in computer science, I needed an elective. So I took a geology course. And uh, after taking that first course, I was hooked. Uh, so I finished out my degree taking numerous geology courses then went on some uh, uh, field work, some schools that were uh, sponsored by uh, UNH and Cornell uh, to do some field work and took a couple trips down the Grand Canyon with uh, the geology department of Worcester College in Worcester, Ohio uh, with my wife Carol and um, I'm just hooked on it, absolutely hooked on it. Yeah, well you know some people might go out there and say oh yeah well one rock looks like the other but you're saying that they're not alike. That's correct. However, uh, from, from a distance, all rocks may look very similar. But when you consider things like uh, how they've been formed, uh, what they're made up of, how they got to where they are, there's, all those are differences uh, that need to be considered. And uh, each of those differences tells a story about how the rocks were uh, uh, made yeah. and how they got there. And you were telling me that uh, when I say rocks, 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 you say, well, let's talk about minerals and rocks. So there, that makes a difference there, I guess. There are definitely differences in rocks. Uh, some of the differences are what the rocks are made out of, uh, how they were formed, how they got to the positions that we see them in. All of those attributes tell us a story about the environment and about those rocks in particular. Mm -hmm. And so what is the difference? Minerals, rocks, what? There are differences between minerals and rocks. Typically, um, a rock is made up of a collection of minerals. Okay? And this is a rock? And this is a rock. And what we see with this rock is we see that this is made up of several different minerals. We see uh, uh, a lot of tourmaline. That's what this black is that we see all through here. This is tourmaline, which is a mineral. Then we also see mica here, uh, the shiny 
uh, shiny mineral that we see is mica. A lot of times uh, mica appears in what's called a book, okay, and a book meaning that the uh, mica has a uh, pattern of what's called foliation that the, the, the sheets of mica arrange like the pages of a book. Okay. And that's why they call it a book of mica. Mica is a mineral. Oh. Okay. So in this rock, we see tourmaline, which is a mineral. We see mica, which is a mineral. The white, some of the white is what's called feldspar, which is a mineral. Uh, there's also some quartz here, this lighter color here is quartz, which is also a mineral. Mm -hmm. And if we look a little further on this, we'll see traces of garnet, which is some red uh, that we'll see throughout here, which okay. is garnet. So we have a collection of minerals which make up a rock. Okay, interesting. Well, Littleton is teeming with uh, interesting geology. This is what you've taught me. And you took me on a field trip of Prouty Woods, Long Lake, and Oak Hill. And uh, you wanted to tell me a story about how parts of Littleton originated off the coast of Africa and traveled here between, what, 49 and 300 million years ago? And uh, we looked at some rocks that told parts of this story, and we also talked about the more recent Ice Age, which ended in 12,000 to 15,000 years ago. Mm -hmm and has shaped the landscape that we see today. So apparently the rocks tell the story. Indeed they do, Barbara. Uh, the Oak Hill, Prouty Woods, and Long Lake on our trip through Littleton represented some Ice Age features. Those mm -hmm. were the more recent features that we really see today. Mm -hmm. Long Lake, is what's considered a kettle pond. Oh yeah. Okay, and a kettle pond is formed. You have to remember that about 15,000, 20,000 years ago, this area was covered with ice. Ice that was about one mile thick. Hmm. And the ice had been here for many tens of thousands of years. As that ice started to recede or melt, as uh, or melt, um, pieces of ice drop off the glacier because as it's melting, the ice becomes incompetent okay. and starts breaking apart. When some of these large pieces of ice break off, they make depressions in the ground. Okay. Some of these depressions are called kettle holes. Mm -hmm. If the kettle hole fills with water because the large piece of ice has uh, interrupted the aquifer, you'll get what's called a kettle pond oh, okay. or a kettle lake. So that's kind of interesting about Long Lake. I mean, you know, you look at it, it's Long Lake. It's been here. Mm -hmm. But to think that it was started that way, that's truly uh, fascinating. So, um, and then uh, I liked our little trip through Oak Hill, and you showed me many boulders there that uh, you gave me some information about. Uh, when we started walking through Oak Hill, we went into what's called Tophet's Chasm. Mm -hmm. And our walk started through a beautiful stand of hemlock, if you remember. Yeah. And we came upon a couple large boulders, and there was nothing higher than us around there, but yet we saw these large boulders there. Those boulders were, are known as glacial erratics. Mm. And when, again, when the ice was here, you have to consider this ice is carrying all, all this rock and grit and stuff that it's picked up as the ice is advancing forward. And when I say advancing forward, I mean the ice is coming from the north going to the south. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it would form in the coldest spot progressing to the um, warmer spot. When the ice starts to melt, it starts moving back towards the north and it starts dropping all the stuff that it picked up. Okay. And some of the stuff that it picked up are boulders that are known as erratics, erratic boulders. Mm -hmm. So it drops these boulders as it backs up. 
and, and they basically dot our landscape, particularly in New England, mm -hmm. with uh, glacial erratics and, uh, and other landforms too, such as the Kettle Pond, mm -hmm. Kettle Holes. So when we go to Oak Hill from now on and we look at these boulders, we have to realize how old they truly are, aren't they? Indeed, yeah, indeed. Yeah. And, and uh, not only are they old, um, but uh, you need to consider how they traveled there how they got there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's too much. Well, the recent earthquake that we had here in Littleton, uh, it makes us aware that we're living on a fault. And that's just in case you don't know this. We are living on a fault. And uh, you reminded me that we are on the Clinton Newberry Fault and that it, it's between uh, three Oh, these numbers are unreal. 370 to 450 million years old. Plus or minus. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Um, it actually runs from eastern Connecticut to Newbury, Mass. And um, again, can, can you believe we're sitting here uh, in Littleton? We always think it's, uh, now we're thinking it's 300 years old. But think about the geology around us and how old that truly is. I mean, I doubt we'll be around to celebrate a 370 million year here, but uh, at least 300 years. So, um, yeah, tell us um, a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, that. Okay, what happened was uh, approximately, as you say, 370 to 450 million years ago, uh, the continents were in a different position than they are today. Mm -hmm. And um, the continents at that time were arranged such that Africa and South America were grouped together approximately on the South Pole. And to the west of Africa were a number of what's called terrains, which are pieces of land. And um, through what's called plate tectonics, which is the moving of the continents and land masses, Littleton was actually located off of Western Africa in one of these terrains. Mm -hmm. So we have Africa down here, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. and we have what we think of as North America up here. Uh -huh. So Littleton is down here where Africa is. And over, over time, millions and millions of years, these terrains start shifting, moving, and eventually these terrains, they're banging into one another, and eventually these terrains dock against North America. So here we have North America, which didn't include all of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, here comes the peace with Littleton. Then here comes the peace with Boston. Then here comes the peace with Cape Cod. And as these terrains docked up against one another, the positions where they dock, there's a fault. And one, of the, okay. and one of the faults that, uh, of note is the Clinton Newberry Fault, which, as you said, runs from eastern Connecticut up to Newberry, uh, Massachusetts. Hmm. Yeah, you know, thank you, because, um, you know, we say faults. I'm sitting here thinking, oh yeah, that makes sense. Now I know what a fault is. And I, I don't know, I guess I just thought they appeared because they felt like it or something. I don't know, I, didn't, I wasn't putting it together with what you um, um, had to say there. So um, anyway, uh, let's see. Okay, now recently I went to Nova Scotia mm. to visit a friend. Great place. And uh, of course, went to the beach and picked up rocks. And um, I, I just thought I'd show you a couple to see what you had to say about my find. But uh, here is one. This is really uh, interesting, Barbara. This is a fossil. This is called a calamite. Okay, which uh, all through Nova Scotia, uh, about 500 million years ago, there were very dense forests, not just through Nova Scotia, but all, all uh, through what we consider North America and, and other parts of the world. And these forests 
are known as the as the coal period. Okay. Okay. Also known as the Carboniferous period. Okay. Geology is great if you like terminology because you got all this terminology that you can use. And um, what happened in Nova Scotia? Uh, all this vegetation grew, and part of the vegetation were these tree-like uh, objects known as calamites. And these were long trees of varying size. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a section of a calamite uh, tree trunk, well. if you will. And you can see the uh, bark-like yeah. fossilization yeah. on that. And that's what that is. So that's a, uh, that's a great find. Oh, good. Good. Can I keep it? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to give it to my grandson and let him take it to school uh, for see, show and tell. That's a, a great thing to do. And then this is uh, just one more that I, I uh, picked up, and I, I just happened to like the look of it. And, uh, and actually, I wasn't thinking about going to Nova Scotia and picking up rocks. Mm -hmm. I went to visit my friend, but because you and I had already talked about, you know, the geology around us, now I'm looking at every single rock I see. Perfect. And, uh, of course, when you go to the beaches there, you're going to see a lot of rocks. But I did pick up just a couple, and I thought I'd bring them back to you and, and see if I had a good start. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as a bad rock. So if a rock strikes your interest, that's great, because every rock has a story to okay. tell. What really interests me uh, looking at this rock is these pretty significant streaks of red in here. At first glance, I would say that uh, this looks like it's pretty significant over here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you look. Um, that this is, this is uh, quartz, but there appears to be a lot of uh, garnet in mm. here. Mm. And um, that, too, is a great find. Oh, that good. has some pretty significant uh, garnet in it. Good. That's great. Okay, the serious collector needs uh, special tools when they go out there. But what about someone like myself who's going with uh, my grandson, uh, you know, so that he can get something for a school project? What would we take with us? The first item that you would need is an understanding of the land that you're going to collect off of. You have to make sure that you're allowed to collect on it. Um, and that you have the proper permissions in place. Okay. That's, that's, that's the first thing. Okay, but it, well, that would be mostly if it's private property and stuff, wouldn't it? I mean, like if we were going to the beach or, you know, just in a field. Uh, uh, correct, but you would also need to be conscious of going to conservation land. Okay. Uh, whatever rules they have in place there, national parks, whatever okay. rules are in place there. So you need to be okay. uh, aware of that. Right. Now, once you understand that, what you need is curiosity and you need enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And really with those two things, you can go out and have a, have a great time. Uh -huh. uh, to go a little further, what I would suggest is uh, bringing some magnification, such as this. Okay. So when you find something interesting, you can look at it up close see what what's in it what's in it okay. what it, what it may be made of you should bring a notebook keep some notes where we were and yeah where you were and any any anything relevant to your trip okay a camera of course uh to take a picture of something that you find interesting okay um th those would be the essential the essential things oh and a bucket oh, if yeah. you're collecting something that's Bring right. a bucket. I can't tell you how many times I've been out without a bag or without a bucket. And okay. I always say, i got to bring a bucket. Okay. So, yeah. bring a bucket. So, um, what about these other tools that you have there? Well, if you're going to do a little more serious collecting where specimens may be still in place, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to use some persuasion to get them out. Okay. And a lot of times the per persuasion comes in the form of rock hammers, chisels the, okay. of this type, All right. um, and uh, always make sure you have eye protection. 
absolutely important to have eye protection. And if you're working in any place with overhanging rocks, oh. you need to be very conscious of the position of rocks. And sometimes it's even good to have a hard hat on. Oh, okay. But generally, um, when you're out in the open, uh, those things aren't needed. Oh. All right. Now, when you get back into the lab or your home and you want to further examine what may be beyond the, uh, um, the story of the rock, is you can use what's called a scratch test. Mm -hmm. And what happens is with every mineral, they all, they have, minerals have different attributes. Mm -hmm. They have the color, as you see in this mineral, the mm -hmm. color is orange. And the mineral also has a certain shape. If you look at this perfectly formed mineral, you can see that, that yeah. it has that shape. And this shape, by the way, is mimicking how the atoms of this, of this mineral are lined up. And when a mineral gets to grow in a position where it's not being flattened, flattened by something where it gets to grow, yeah. the shape of the crystal, also known as the habit of the crystal, mimics the, the arrangement of the atoms. Okay. Okay, and this is a good shape of this. Um, so you would so, have go, extra tools then, especially if you're serious about collecting, you'd have absolutely. tools like this. This is called a scratch test mm -hmm. kit. And um, different rocks have a different affinity for being scratched. Okay. We always think of diamonds being one of the hardest things yeah. and uh, talc being one of the softest things. Mm -hmm. If you have any question on, the, on what you think a rock is and you think that knowing the hardness of the rock will help you determine that, you use these scratch tools. Okay. And each of these have a different hardness and based on whether or not this scratches the specimen or not mm -hmm. will tell you something about the, the, uh, what the rock is okay. or the mineral is. Now, one other uh, thing that you can use is also a ultraviolet light. Uh -huh. This is when you really get into it heavy. A lot of rocks have the attribute that under ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. they fl fluoresce a different color and the colors are beautiful really absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful and um, you get into a dark room with your rock or mineral specimen shut the lights off and put the ultraviolet light on and hold the rock hold the specimen under the light mm -hmm. and uh, based on what colors fluoresce that tells you something about the type of specimen that you're dealing with. So then you need to get books and Gotta you need books. to read them so that you know exactly what you're, you're looking for or what's happening to that rock. Yeah, yeah. I can understand that. Rocks, uh, books are great for um, reference, yeah. absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the Mineralogical uh, Society? I know that uh, you say they started in 1963. And uh, so why don't you tell us, like, um, you go on field trips, uh, you have uh, members bring samples for discussion, and uh, you can tell us where they meet. Maybe sure. someone's interested. Sure. The Neshoba Valley Mineralogical Society, as you said, um, was formed in 1963. We meet on the second Tuesday of every month from September through June. Okay. Okay, and we meet at uh, from 7 o'clock to about 9 o'clock, and that's at the J.V. Fletcher Library in Westford, okay. right, right on uh, the common in Westford. And what we do is we have a, a, a small membership, and we're looking to grow the membership. And what we are is a collection of people that like rocks, like minerals, like geology. So uh, a typical meeting would consist of um, we, we bring in our rock of the month or mineral of the month and we talk about the specimens that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and we may also bring in samples of uh, minerals or rocks that we collected on various field trips. Because mm -hmm. another activity that the club 
um, uh, often does is we organize field trips to go to various local mines and collecting spots to work in the field collecting stuff, mm -hmm. rocks and minerals. Mm -hmm. um, so after we collect that, we like to come back and, and show them off to one another and talk about uh, what it is we found or what it is we think we found. Mm -hmm. Because it's, uh, this is a field that you're always learning. You know, and, and one of the key resources you have for learning uh, about geology, about minerals, is, be, is, is talking to other people. Right, right. Okay, they, so, they're very helpful. Good. Well, you know, there is so much to learn and uh, we don't have much time, but I think that maybe uh, you can continue some time with other shows just to, uh, you know, pique the interest of our viewers or people that are interested in uh, collecting. So um, we'll look forward to you trying to do some of that. And um, I, I want to thank you so much for coming. And I hope that you enjoyed the show. Uh, I think that if you're interested in collecting rocks, you can find out more about the uh, society or you can get in touch with Bill. We'll have the addresses there here for you. And um, why don't you find out a little bit more about it? I think that, uh, I mean, you know, it made me interested. I've been out there. I can't look at a rock uh, in the face again, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> they're all gonna be different to me. But um, anyway, I do want to thank you all for uh, watching today. And in the meantime, or till next time, don't forget to hug a senior. You know what, we can do it three times a year. Okay. Part of, part of the significance of coming up here in our geoli, geologic history, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. When a hole was filled in, the, was, there was a hole that was, I should start over. Yeah. When there was a, when the ice was melting. Uh, I'm gonna try to uh, throw a rock down to the bottom of the chasm to see if we can project some sound to give you an idea of the depth of it. So let's, let's give this a try. Here we go. Whoop. <laughs> I'm gonna throw a rock down to see if I can reach the bottom of the chasm and cause some noise to give you a sense. Here we go. I couldn't hit that tree. I've hit it twice now. You've heard about rock and roll, rock around the clock, the rock gets, rock of... Oh, <laughs> That's what I want to say. <laughs>